All right. So I just want to thank everyone for, for making it out here tonight. I know this is a, uh, it's, it's getting late and this is the, the last presentation. Fortunately, I only have, only have 20 minutes to torture you guys with. So, <laughs> all right. And, uh, you know, before we get started, I just want to let you know that this is, uh, this is going to go over my, my methodology. This is not how to get a CVE or, or even how to do cutting edge research because this is not cutting edge research. But if you're looking for a CVE, I feel after watching this presentation, uh, at least point you in the right direction. All right, so now in regards to our agenda, there's, you know, the, the staple, who am I, the, the tyranny of the default, applied open source intelligence, or OSINT, as I'm sure everyone here is aware of, and we're going to go over some case studies, and uh, this presentation will just go over some, uh, some vulnerabilities that I, I found personally. Um, starting, starting June as of last year, I, I, I gave myself a, I just wanted to find one CVE and, uh, you know, why you should listen to this talk. I am not an expert, but you know I have found uh, several dozen CVEs, and this is just to go over my, my methodology. All right, so who am I? Uh, I am a security analyst at Sadar, and, and they're an, an, an awesome uh, managed uh, security services provider, where they provide MDR, EDR, and penetration testing services. Most importantly, I'm a bug enthusiast. I love insects. I love praying mantis. I raise praying mantis, and that's... Uh, uh, that's uh, the, on the right you see uh, who I call uh, Lightning Lily because she had really fast reflexes, but love praying mantis. And if you're interested, I did uh, some previous talks. Earlier this year, I did a, a fire talk at ShmooCon in regards to Android exploitation and a talk on Bluetooth uh, reverse engineering last year at Peaside Rochester. All right, so now we're going to go over the, the title, the, the tyranny of the default. And I'm just going to start off with a quote from Steve Gibson. Um, Security Now is my favorite podcast. It, they have, you know, it, it runs, it runs every Tuesday, and they provide a wealth of knowledge for going on 20 years. He's the CEO of Gibson Research Corporation, author of Spinrite, and uh, he gets down to the assembly and he knows his stuff. But I'm just going to go over his quote, um, and from the words of Steve Gibson, I coined the term years ago, the tyranny of the default, which is the sort of expression I like to use for most users that don't go in and change things. They just like to assume that someone smarter than them chose the settings that are best for them. And so they just say yes when asked a lot of questions. Um, from my perspective, this applies to uh, what started this talk, which is the use of default credentials, and uh, you know, if you think about a, if you think about the overarching power of a tyrant, uh, we often default to, we often default to using default credentials for various reasons, and that kind of buzz clicking word to just use a default to, has caused many issues. So now this is just a, a quick case study. This is this is not something I discovered, but I just I thought it'd make a, a good segue. So. Uh, if you see this uh, article from CISA, if you, you see that uh, programmable logic controllers could be compromised by using a default password of all ones, one, 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 and uh, yeah, not very much entropy in, in that respect, but it, it just goes to show you that, you know, if, our, if, if, if critical infrastructure is, is being protected by um, very low entropy, we can run into all sorts of issues. And, uh, you know, as it states here, you know, um, the PLC was ultimately compromised. So now we're going to go into the, the methodology. Um, now, a lot of people are aware, because in the United States, all, wireless, all wirelessly emitting devices have to meet certain specifications. And because of that, we can get a wealth of knowledge by looking at the, the aggregate report. So if you go to FCC.io or FCC report, you can find, uh, um, you can find public records. Well, you can see internal, ex external schematics. Um, you can get and just uh, a lot of information. Um, surprisingly available. So as I, as I started embarking on this open source uh, in, intelligence, the, the, the issue started with, uh, with an older router I, I, I had in my possession. So I wanted to, uh, looking at the, how the, the, the password was ultimately uh, derived, I, I wanted to see if this was just an issue with my device in particular, if this was a a wider issue, and uh, as you'll see moving forward, this uh, this caused a, a few problems. Now, the main issue here, though, is that if you go to FCC.io, if you look at some of the if you look at some of the diagrams, sometimes you can't get a clear indication of what's going on here. So in this case, I see uh, I see where the the label is, but I'm not getting much information other than that. So using a so. 
in regards to the OSINT portion of the title, um, I used a combination of FCC.io along with a few others, including eBay. All right, so now Eris, uh, Eris makes many models of devices. This, this talk actually did not start with this, with this model right here, um, but part of, my, part of my methodology was if I can't see the if I can't see the contents of a label, then I want to see how else this information can be aggregated. So in my case, I decided just to reference eBay. You know, people sell things on eBay, and uh, oftentimes all the labels are, are readily available. So looking at this information, things become a little bit more apparent here. So let's take a look at this pre-shared key here. So, you know, now to... Uh, to someone who may not be well versed, um, you know, look, looking at that string of characters, it, it may appear to be random, but it, it's anything but random. In fact, this password could, could simply be derived by just taking essentially, in most cases, uh, roughly the first half of the SSID, along with the, the last three octets of the, of, of, the, of the MAC address. Now, the problem, though, it's not so much the fact that they decide to, to base the password off the MAC address, but it really, it's the fact that all the interfaces have a similar MAC address. So if you think about it, if you're going to set a password to be based on the MAC address, but all the MAC addresses, including the wireless interface, were only different by a few characters. So essentially, by just without using any fancy tools, I mean, you could just use like maybe Wiggle Wi-Fi if you're, if you're using Android, you could simply get within proximity of a wireless access point and determine the wireless password by just simply having the name. Now you're probably thinking, well, you know, this is just a default password. We should care about this, but uh, as you'll see moving forward, um, there's, there's a, and uh, this is a, a little bit more than, than the antidotal evidence. All, I would say a, a large majority of the time, when you see these default SSIDs, the passwords have not been changed either. For the same reason, you know, users will get a device, they may have an issue actually accessing the, the, animation, the, the admin panel. So what's simpler? To use what appears to be a random password. And uh, it's, it was easily uh, derivable. So now, here's what's interesting. Now, I actually found this slide after uh, this, this presentation got accepted, and I did not notice this initially. Eris makes a lot of devices. Out of all the devices that had the same issue, only this particular model explicitly said how this password was derived. And I, 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 thought, uh, I thought it was interesting. I, didn't, I actually didn't, didn't figure this out until after the presentation got accepted. But if you see here, if you look on the bottom, uh, where it says WPA2 PSK, it clearly defines that the password is generated from the SSID and the MAC address, and with all the MAC addresses, with all the interfaces essentially being identical except for the final octet, these are easily derived. But it wasn't just Eris that made this problem. Um, it seems to be an issue with with cable modem routers that are that are trying to reach either DOCSIS two or three, that part of that specification. So let's look at some distribution here. Now this uh, this particular model, you see, it says uh, SSID D. DDW365. That's actually a model from UB, not Eris. But we have the same problem here. The, as you'll see moving forward, the password is essentially generated from DDW365, which is like ha roughly half of the SSID, along with the second half of the, the customer MAC address, which is, not, which is an interface which is almost identical to the, the wireless MAC address. And if you look at distribution as of 2019, um, you see these uh, these are spread at, in, in Phoenix, and uh, now I, I didn't I didn't include more recent data, but just citing uh, 2019, these are all default SSIDs, and uh, with uh, a little bit of research, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm approximating that I'd say roughly three fourths of these are also using the same default password. Um, but a little bit anecdotal, but uh, I've had uh, I've encountered many people with these devices, and, and generally speaking, um, users that, that have the knowledge will change their SSID. If you see this default, there's a good, <laughs> there's, it's highly likely. And remember, there's no special tools needed here. You don't you don't have to you don't have to gather packets or anything like that. Just approach the device, look, look, and uh, all that information will be really available. And it's not just UB, and it's not just Eris. There's also Technicolor. You see, uh, here's another device. You see. SSID TC871. Um, now they, they it, it's interesting, I, and I, I haven't only only that one error smile was it actually documented how the, the the algorithm for it. But I find it interesting that there's three different manufacturers all using this very basic logic of 
of, you know, concatenating the MAC address and the SSID to form the default credential. Now, technically for this particular model, it's not exactly the first half of the SSID and the, and the last three octets. There's, it's a, there's, a, there's a slight change, but it's 90% the same. And uh, in regards to, in regards to OSINT, uh, uh, VI Stumbler is very similar to, to Wiggle Wi-Fi. The reason why I, I chose VI Stumbler is that a, a lot of these wireless SSID databases they'll, they'll have like they'll have they'll have throttle and they'll have limits to how how much you can query. In this case for VI Stumbler, there were there were no limits, so you can you can query to your to your heart's content. And um, now, granted, though, that distribution isn't isn't uh, isn't as dense as some of the Aris and UB, but there's a lot of targets, and uh, I'm I'm only showing a few areas. Uh, if you did, if you if you if you stumble across this, you'll you see the, you'll probably notice some of these on your street. All right. So now, in, in regards to the case study, uh, uh, the, the wireless, the wire, the Wi-Fi password algorithm is a, is a focal point of the talk. Um, but as you can see, uh, if you look at the the first CVE uh, 439, that reflects three different models. 438 reflects two, but essentially this is a combination of Eris, UB, and Technicolor. And this kind of got the kind of got the, the gears in my head flowing. So I'm like, well, I wonder how many other manufacturers. So I spent a lot of time just, you know, going, going over eBay, and I, I I relied heavy on eBay, but it's it was the easiest way to, to gather this information. And uh, fortunately, it seems like there was a certain time period where this was like a common collusion when it comes to the this particular scheme. Fortunately, they are they have not made this mistake since subsequent products. But if you have one of these devices. You have more problems to worry about than, than just the default password because a, a large majority of these devices are vulnerable to so many other exploits that you're better off just not using the product entirely. So they, you know, we'll just I recommend end the lifing for for various reasons. There's so many exploits that this is the least you have to worry about, but this is requires no tools to exploit. All right, so now. I like bugs. I also, you know, I growing up, I also had this weird idea that, you know, maybe one day I'd, I'd become an archaeologist. I'd be like Indiana Jones. Well, I decided, well, this is my, it's my, my best opportunity. You want to, if you think about past performance and you think about the idea that, um, that companies are making the same mistakes, I decided, well, let's look at some older devices. Let's see if I can find the, you know, go for some more low hanging fruit. And once again, this is my methodology. This is not how to do cutting edge research, but it got me several CVEs just off this particular issue. Uh, and once again, you know, and I, I don't 100% agree with this quote, the, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, but if you think about credit score and you think about criminal record, you know, we, we unofficially agree that people tend to make the same mistakes again. So at this point, uh, I, I had exhausted uh, all the, you know, all the UB errors and technical devices. And fortunately, they haven't made this mistake in the future. So this isn't the, this isn't the, the smear of these companies. They, they, they actually have learned from this mistake. They, they haven't made any subsequent issues. I started to branch further into the current router that I was using uh, for my ISP, which is actually a Hytron device. Now, interestingly enough, I did not find the same issue. I did find an issue with how passwords were, were being generated for uh, for a Hytron device. It wasn't the, it wasn't the same, but it, in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of worse. All right. So now, before I get into the, that particular password, actually, I, I can go I can go ahead and mention it. It's not really a focal point here, um, but this is password count, so I'm going to go ahead and state it. Um, in, in in this case, for this particular model, which was you know powering my, my home internet. Um, the, the default password was essentially the word Hytron concatenated with a five character with a five with a five hex value, which only was only about a million. That I mean there should be you know in the in the billions, I mean the, the entry was very low. But setting that aside, I wanted to look at some other things. So uh, when, when, when it comes to past performance, I love referencing MITRE directly because you want to you want to find uh, you want to find an exploit. Just see what issues the the manufacturer had before, and most likely they'll have the same issue. So this was someone else's discovery. This uh, this cross site scripting right here. But I'm like um, in, in 2020, so I'm like okay, well this is kind of interesting. If you if uh, if you add their, if you add a device um, and you essentially hit an X button an SSX payload can be triggered. But the problem is that, in my opinion, require a little too much user interaction. And 
so I, I didn't I didn't really like that aspect too much. And also, uh, I wanted to see because this issue actually was fixed. Um, I wanted to see if any other uh, any other parameters were vulnerable. So I just went through each. I went through all the parameters and tried SSX, and I found another one. So I'm like, well, it looks like they didn't. The, I, and I came to the conclusion that he must have just checked one page. I just went through all the other parameters and found another cross-site script. All right, so here's the cross-site script that I found. Now, um, sorry about the, the image here. It's a little bit blurry here. But um, in, in this case, there's a, there's, a page, uh, there's a page in the administration portal called the device location page where you essentially just enter. You can name where you'd like the device to be located at. So like, let's say garage. But within that field, uh, you know, it didn't have proper uh, uh, sanitization of user input, so it gave me, uh, it allowed me to export a user's cookie. Now, the thing about it is, you think in, in, in this particular issue, um, this was only uh, this particular issue can only be exploited by someone with the administrator rights. Fortunately, even though that even though admin rights were required, look at this like a booby trap. So if you if you're able to if you're able to log into the administration panel, you could set this cross-site payload, and if the user changed their password but happened to visit the page, you could exfiltrate that data. And here's just a quick demo of that. And uh, it's not uh, we're not going to go into the weeds of it, but essentially what what, what this demonstration shows is uh, me setting up an, an AWS box. Uh, me visiting the page and me showing data, data being exfiltrated via SSX. And things get a little bit more interesting from here. Um, there's, a little, there's a little bit of a, an IOC if you see how the, you see how everything was displaced right here. Um, but other than that though, just visiting the page, uh, exfiltrated the, the data. And as you can see here, it's shown that the password is depicted here. Uh, but, 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 but let's uh, let's move a little bit further. So you know, I only had one Hytron device, but uh, I actually acquired uh, another device uh, by uh, essentially using a, a combination of eBay and thrift stores and then a little bit of recycling. So I had, an, I had another device, I had an Adtran device. What I find interesting is that I, I found a few issues uh, with this product, and. Once again, during the, the process of creating this presentation, I, I, I discovered that uh, that someone else had reported some similar issues. They they must, but they just kind of they just they held off on uh, on publishing the CVE. So we kind of had some simultaneous submissions, but these are for different products. So the reason why I say deja vu, I'll explain that here in a second. Here, all right. So I don't expect you guys to be able to read this, but what's important here is that. Back to the password con. Now we're all used to you know router seven default passwords are admin admin. I mean this is not. This is this is anything uh, this is anything crazy. What's interesting about this though is that they they, they had they had one interesting mitigation. So although the default password for root was admin to admin, if you plug the device into the the Ethernet, it it was publicly accessible over the internet, which kind of gave us a race condition. So if you have an Ethernet cable plugged in there, that's enough time for your device to already be compromised because it's already it's wide open. So even though they required a password change, it wasn't quite good enough. And there's some other issues I found. Um, I eventually did find a cross-site scripting here, and uh, and I also found some other issues regarding telnet service and command injection. We're gonna just move forward a little bit here. So here I'm gonna. I'm, this is a, a quick demo. It's gonna segue into the, the second vulnerability. So um, I'm not terribly surprised that you know they had default admin admin, although that you know that's that's a that's a botnet herder's dream. Interesting. Th this is just gonna show how during the during the setup process. How I can go ahead and create another account um, with root level privileges, and even after the person changed the password, I'd still have a way access. I still have a way access the device. What, what I found interesting about this, uh, while I was looking at some of the other devices, uh, other accounts that, that were on this device, is I realized another issue. Well, there was a there was a hard coded account here for a hard coded support account, support account that also had root level permissions. And guess what? It's very similar to the Wi Fi issue. The, the default password is ultimately based on the MAC address. So, so, there's, so there's, a, there was, there's, there's essentially a hard coded, uh, I'm going to get into this in a second here. Um, this just shows me adding the account. So we're going to move forward here. Now, here we have the support account here. Uh, and the thing about it is, All right. Um, 
All right. So j- j- just to wrap things up, this support account, uh, it had a root level password that, that consisted of the, the second half of the MAC address. And uh, if you think about it, if you're connected to a network, you can just, by looking at the gateway address, you can easily determine what that information is or through the, through the Wi-Fi, through the BSS ID. So that's obviously not a good situation here. And how did I locate this? Well, another one of their devices, they documented this on one of their products, only one of them. But because, you know, AdTran bought, uh, bought SmartRG, they, they didn't update all the documents, so we end up in this strange situation here. So we're gonna go over that. And uh, the other issue, and this is a little bit uh, a little bit redundant, there was also a command injection that did require authentication, but because there are so many ways to bypass authentication, this is a little bit redundant, but it's still something that should be fixed in software. And this is just using shell meta characters. You wanna know how to do that? Try port swigger. This is, you know, the, this tutorial is how I figured it out. Very straightforward. And just a quick demo showing that, and we are almost done here. And if you think about shell meta characters, you think about things like like tick, uh, um, you know, uh, the the dollar uh, the dollar parentheses. Some of these symbols can be used uh, in Linux versus Windows, and and in this case, there was BusyBox under um, there was BusyBox under it, so it would just allow me to, to inject shell meta characters, and that uh, that gave me command injection with root. Now, once again, it's authenticated, but it's easy to bypass the. That, that requirement here. So we're gonna go ahead and just move forward because we're, we're short on time. So we gotta get to the conclusions here. Manufacturers should require users to set a new password before a device can be used. Self-explanatory, but for the, for the at least the AdTran devices, these devices were, were produced in the, in the last few years. So these are new devices. Fortunately, AdTran was great. Uh, they, they, they updated their firmware and they fixed all these devices. So at least for AdTran, they, uh, they were a great vendor to work with. Um, and uh, and not to say anything bad about anybody else, I just didn't get a whole lot of feedback. And uh, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to see me once again. And uh, I'm out of time here, but I love being in Vegas, so have a great evening. If you have any questions, uh... Well, uh, being from Norway myself, one of the things I know is that in the state of California, there's a law saying that you're not allowed to sell products or software hardware with default passwords in them. I have no idea how they are actually uh, you know, uh, using that law for in, in real life. But what you're showing now is, because I've seen this for the past 20 years at least, products are, you know, the, the vendors are putting in very simple algorithms for generating passwords so that in many cases, the vendors or the companies selling these products will be able to support the customers because the customers will call in and say, I, I, I can't remember the password, I lost the, the paper piece. And then they can say, well, just tell me the numbers on you know, like your serial number or your MAC address, and then we can sort of help you figure out the passwords. That's one of the reasons. But as with the law in California, if you say that, well, you're not allowed to have default passwords, then it's sort of interesting to, you know, would you have an opinion on when they have so incredibly easy um, solutions in place to sort of generate or guess the password? Do you think that you could say that is not allowed either according to the law in California? Is that a question? <laughs> I, 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 for me, it's that the default is just, I feel like the product should not be usable until after password change. Because I, I mean, there has to be some kind of initial setup, but the problem, and, and granted though, like I, I found, I found even way more issues than this. I, I just, just too many unfixed issues at this point. But I, you know, I, default credentials is uh, we're under the the tyranny. Of that the is default. a problem. Yeah, yeah. Questions. Hey. One question. No questions. Thank you for being here. Interesting talk. And of course, enjoy Vegas. <laughs>